Welcome to another in our series of Edge Revision webinars. Uh, this is where we take a topic on the syllabus and we pose 10 questions for you to have a go at to test your understanding. We go through the answers and uh, do a bit of revision at the same time. Now, this Edge webinar is on financial economics. Some uh, variety of questions coming up. Uh, there'll be 10 questions. If you're on the live version of the webinar, type your answer into the chat window and let's see how people are doing. If you're not, if you're watching the YouTube version, then have a pen and paper handy, keep your own score and maybe have your revision notes to hand as we go through each of the questions. Go well. Let's see if you can get a score of seven or more on this test. Uh, before we do that, of course, financial economics is uh, fairly new on the syllabus for the new level economics. The amount of detail does vary by exam board. So be careful to check your specification really carefully to see what's needed. If you want to access all of our revision notes, videos and study resources on financial economics, just point your smartphone camera at the QR code on the bottom left of this slide. And that should hopefully take you to the tutor to you landing page for our study resources. Uh, just before we crack on with the questions, a bit of back, bit of contextual background. The UK financial sector, if we just take financial and insurance services, banking and insurance, for example, it's worth over £120 billion a year in terms of GDP. It's nearly 7% of our total national output. Britain has a comparative advantage in financial and insurance services with a trade surplus in excess of a billion pounds a week in 2016. And the sector itself employs over a million people. Uh, it's about 3% of the employed labour force and uh, partly through corporation tax and income tax and the bank levy. Uh, contributed nearly £500 million a week to the government's revenues. So the financial sector is important in the UK context. I'm sure you've become aware of that in your study of the topic. Here is our first question. Which of the following best describes the role of commercial banks in an economy? A, B, C or D. Take a moment to read through the options. Press the pause button and press play when you want to go through the answer. So question one, which of the following best describes the role of commercial banks in an economy? Which, which question, which answer did you go for? The correct answer, the best definition there is C, to hold savings of those with surplus funds and lend to those requiring loans. The roles of financial markets are often twofold to meet the needs of both, both savers and borrowers. It's the best definition. A financial market is any exchange, any trading platform that allows the trading of financial instruments such as stocks, in other words, uh, shares, bonds issued by businesses and by governments. Currency trading is financial economics. And increasingly, commodity trading has a financial aspect as commodities are treated as financial assets in their own right. This slide is a useful revision reminder of some of the key functions of financial markets to facilitate saving, to lend, to allocate financial capital to productive uses, to facilitate exchange, so things like payment systems, and also to provide forward markets, uh, things like hedging, so you can buy your currency in advance to reduce uncertainty. OK, question one. The answer there was C. Let's move on to question two. Good luck with this one. Banks create money by doing what? Banks create money by doing what? Uh, take a moment to think about your answer. Press the pause button and I'll be back with you in a few seconds. So how do banks create money? Do they print money in their own mint? Do they create money by offering good interest to depositors? Do they create money by offering loans such as mortgages? Well, the best answer here is D. Banks create money whenever they make a loan which in turn results in more deposits. Banks create credit by extending a loan, agreeing a loan perhaps to a business or a household that needs finance. They don't always have to attract savings in the first place because they can get some, some funding from the wholesale money markets. They could borrow from other banks or they could raise equity. But crucially, when a bank makes a loan, they credit the bank account of the borrower. So for example, I might go to the bank, I might have £5,000 in my account already, but I want to take out a loan of £10,000, perhaps to pay for some home improvements. If I'm given a bank loan, my account will now have £15,000 
in the account. The bank has credited my account with a loan. At that moment, the bank has created money. Question number three. The government issues a 10-year bond at a nominal price of £500 and offers a coupon of £20. Confidence in the government grows, investor confidence improves, causing the market price of the bond to rise to £800. What is the new yield on the bond? Have a go, press that pause button and I'll be back with you when you're ready. So this question is about the crucial relationship between the market price of a bond and the yield on a bond. What did you get for question three? The answer is B, 2.5%. You see, the yield on a bond is effectively the interest rate on a bond. The yield is the amount of interest paid, otherwise known as the coupon, divided by the market price of the bond and multiplied by 100% to express a percentage. So the bond initially was worth £500, was paying £20 interest, 4% interest, 4% yield. But now the bond has gone up in price. The initial yield, therefore, was 4%. At the higher price, it's now trading at £800. The coupon doesn't change. It's still £20. This is the fixed interest bond market. And so, for, therefore, the yield is £20 over £800. goes down to 2.5%. Can you see here that an increase in the price, the market price of the bond, has led to a fall in the yield on a bond? It's a very important relationship, and one that examiners often test. Well, they test quite regularly, in fact. So, for example, a government bond is what's known as a fixed interest bond. That means that the government pays a coupon, a fixed interest per year, whoever holds the bond. Now, the coupon is fixed. But the yield on the bond will vary. The yield is the coupon divided by the market price. So therefore, when bond prices are going up, the yield will fall. When bond prices are falling, the yield will go up. There's an inverse relationship between the two. I hope we've got question three right. Have a go at question number four. Here it comes. In 2011, the global money supply, narrowly defined, rose by 11%. And broadly defined money increased roughly 8% as central banks continued efforts to keep interest rates low. What type of policy does this statement illustrate? Have a go. OK, question four. Are you confident in this one? The right answer is, in the top, hand, top right hand corner of your screen, the answer is D. This is an expansionary monetary policy. Expansionary policy is when the central bank cuts interest rates or takes steps to increase the supply of credit. Uh, basically, it's another another phrase for it is a, 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 a loosening or an accommodatory monetary policy designed to stimulate demand and output in the economy and perhaps lift an economy away from deflationary pressure. So low interest rates, for example, in the UK, this chart shows the base rate set by the Bank of England since 2006. And of course, for most of the last decade, the base rate's been at 0.5%, even a tad low after the Brexit vote. Monetary policy has been <coughs> highly expansionary in this sense. Base rates have been well below sort of normal historic levels. Here's question five. Banks must ensure that they are profitable liquid and secure. The main way in which they achieve these aims is to hold a range of assets. Which of the following options, A, B, C or D, shows a list from most liquid asset to least liquid asset? Have a go, press that pause button once more and let's see what we get on this one. OK, so what do you think the answer is to question five? What's the most liquid asset a bank can hold? What's the least liquid asset? The correct answer to question five is B. Liquidity is best defined as the ease with which some asset can be converted to cash. 
can immediately be spended, of course, with little risk of loss of value. So cash deposits in the banking system are liquid assets. A treasury bill is a short-term government loan, typically of less than three months to, to sort of cover short-term increases in government spending. Shares are quite heavily traded, FTSE 100 firms for sure, you can buy and sell them quite easily. But there's always a risk, of course, when you sell your shares, that you might have to sell them at a loss. So they're not perfectly liquid assets. And buildings are the least liquid asset that one can have. Oftentimes it takes months, sometimes even longer, if you want to liquidate the asset and turn it into cash. How are we doing after five questions? How are we doing? Question five, the answer there was B. Question six, which of the following combinations correctly describes commercial banks and investment banks? Which of those combinations is a correct combination of description of commercial banks and investment banks? Have a go. OK, the answer to question six is D. Commercial banks manage deposit accounts for businesses. Most businesses have accounts with with uh, commercial bank. Tutor to you, for example, has an account with the Bank of Scotland, I think, and maybe some others as well. They handle our finances. Investment banks are, crucially, they help uh, companies to make initial public offerings when they're launching on the stock market. So the day I'm recording this video, Spotify has actually launched on the US stock market. It may actually have avoided using an investment bank, I think, but most companies, when they're underwriting getting a stock a stock market flotation underway will bring in one of the big investment banks Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank, UBS. Now, these banks are different to commercial banks in a sense because they trade and invest on their own account. So they trade in capital markets and bonds and equities and things. Commercial banks tend they can do that, but investment banks tend to have a more specific specialized functions for companies and big investors. Question seven, credit rating agencies such as Standard & Poor's have taken some blame for the 2007-2008 global financial crisis. They provided high credit ratings for some derivatives which contained risky assets. Now, buyers of those assets, derivatives, believe that they were less risky than they actually were. Which type of financial market failure is this an example of? Have a go. OK, so I think the best answer to question seven is C, information asymmetry. There was a uh, an information failure, an information gap that in this complex world of derivatives, there was a failure to price risk appropriately, in part because the credit ratings agencies knew less about the quality of the bonds, subprime mortgages, for example, than the people who were selling them. Uh, I've put in a, a picture here from a famous film which covers the financial crisis. This is the scene where Mark Baum uh, heads to see the credit rating agencies to discuss their pricing of bonds in the film The Big Short. Fantastic film, well worth seeing. Question eight is another question on financial market failure. Which of the following is an example of a market failure in a financial market? A market failure. A, a commercial bank lends to a high-risk borrower. B, households place all of their savings in a complex high-risk product. C, regulators are unable to understand properly the risks a bank is taking. And D, confidence rises, so demand for assets such as shares starts to increase. What's the best answer there? Well, I think the best answer to this question is... B. It's the best answer because B is an example of information failure. Oftentimes in financial economics, consumers of financial products don't really understand, fully understand the complexity of a product. So, for example, they may have little knowledge of the of the stocks they're choosing in the in the in the current in the um, stock market. Uh, they may have very little true understanding of the, of the complexity of the pension scheme that they've signed up to. So, information failure is a major cause of market failure in financial markets. D is possible, it's hinting at a herd mentality, but I didn't say anything about herd mentality in the answer, so you can't really choose it. And quite a few people choose C. Well, C is probably best described as a regulatory failure, a form of government failure, rather than a market 
failure. A, a commercial bank lends to a high risk borrower, well that's a, there's a private cost and a private benefit of doing so and the commercial bank is making its own decisions. It's not necessarily a market failure in its own right. So the answer to question eight is B. We're doing well folks. Two more questions to go on this session. Which three of the following are functions of the Bank of England? Which three of the following are functions of the Bank of England? I'll give you a clue on this one. Function three is right. Okay. Have a go and uh, let's see what you think the answer is. So three is right. The Bank of England is charged with maintaining the stability of the UK financial sector. It publishes uh, a financial stability report twice a year through the Financial Policy Committee of the Bank of England. What else goes with three, however? The correct answer is A. The Bank of England is charged with the responsibility for maintaining the integrity of the currency, in particular maintaining low inflation, maintaining price stability so that money holds its value as a store of value. And two is right. Uh, they set, the Bank of England of course is charged with setting bank interest rates. Monetary Policy Committee, which meets eight times a year to decide interest rates. Four is wrong. The government, uh, so the Bank of England, uh, operates a free floating exchange rate and therefore does not intervene in the currency markets. And the Bank of England does not set rigorous strict limits on how much commercial banks can lend. Pretty much the amount of lending that takes place is subject to market forces. There are one or two limitations on mortgage lending. The Bank of England does not operate a strict, for example, cash to deposits ratio. It doesn't operate supply side controls on lending. It could do, but it chooses not to. We have reached the 10th question. Thanks for sticking with us. Have a go at number 10. What is meant by liquidity preference? What is meant by liquidity preference? Have a go. Press the pause button one more time and come back to me when you're ready to go through the answer. Okay, so what did you think? What is meant by liquidity preference? The answer is, well, the best answer here is C, desire to hold assets that are convertible into cash. Liquidity is holding assets in a liquid form. Money can be held in any form. You can argue a building is money. It doesn't necessarily fulfill the functions of money. But the key thing is liquidity. People, are hoping, people when they want uh, strong liquidity, want access to cash or convertible assets that they can easily turn into cash when they need to. Think about, for example, uh, the fragility of the banking system and the fragility of the economic system during the European financial crisis when the Greek government, for example, was poised to default on some of its long-term loans. Bond investors would have sought liquidity preference. They would have tried to get rid of their long-term bonds that the Greek government might default on and turn those bonds into cash if they could or convert into any other asset which is more liquid than a 10-year bond. So liquidity preference is the desire to hold assets that are easily convertible into cash. So there we go. There were your 10 questions on financial economics. One more time, if you'd like to go to our financial economics resource page, our landing page for loads of videos and study notes and uh, quizzes, on financial economics, just point your smartphone camera at the QR code and you will be taken to that page. Thanks an awful lot for joining in on this one. Hope you scored well and uh, catch up on our other Edge videos very soon. Thank you.